Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and what's next. It's a show that asks questions and peels back the layers of our average everyday experience and goes beyond scratching the surface. We interview people doing incredible things who are making a difference around the globe. Join me as we listen in and get one step closer to understanding that big ideas shared create collaboration. Collaboration can inspire community and communities create social change. I'm David Peck and this is Face to Face. So my next interview is with what I mean I'm falling in love with a lot of film directors at the uh, 40th anniversary of TIFF this year and having a great time watching a lot of interesting and uh, rem remarkable films actually on so many levels but Ciro Guerra is a Colombian filmmaker a young guy who's uh, done an incredible thing and uh, his film Embrace of the Serpent which I highly recommend black and white film brilliant film on so many levels it really is and the interview that uh, we had uh, together a few days ago September 11th uh, of this year during the festival was uh, full of uh, commentary about uh, Colombia, the Amazon. Um, you know, Ciro asks a question, what do you see when you, you know, look at a forest? And this is a film about uh, colonialization. It's a film about the environment. It's a film about listening. It's a film about crossing other cultures. And so I think you're, uh, I know you're going to enjoy this interview. So uh, stay tuned, listen a little closer, because that's kind of what Ciro is actually asking you to do. This is about the splash and ripple effect. It's about memory and it's about history. And I think you're going to fall in love with the film and Ciro, Embrace of the Serpent. Well, welcome to Face to Face. We are joined by a very special guest here today, a 40th anniversary of TIFF, as uh, some of you out there may know. And we are joined by a Colombian uh, director, filmmaker, writer, director, uh, Ciro Guerrero. Mm -hmm. Yes? Close? Yeah, close. Ciro Guerra. Ciro Guerra. Thank you for joining us today. So your film, Embrace of the Serpent, uh, I saw it yesterday uh, for the first time on the big screen, uh, black and white. Uh, obviously a very intentional and conscious choice on your part and one of the thoughts that came to me about halfway through is why black and white why contrast over color mm -hmm. yes uh, this this film is inspired by the, the the travel diaries and photographs taken by the first explorers that uh, went around the colombian amazon and when i saw these photographs they were very impressive for me because it was what you see in there is an amazon that is completely different than the idea of the Amazon that we have today. Mm. It's an Amazon that is completely devoid of exuberance, uh, exoticism, and it's also a world in which uh, the, the communities that lived there were, were in a very pure state, which is not the, not the case right now. So it's not, it's, 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 in a way it feels like a lost world, like a separate reality. These are about 80 to 90 years old, some of these photos? <coughs> yeah. yeah, it's early 20th century. Early, early 20th century. So. And I, I wanted the, the film to have this kind of feel, this kind of timeless uh, feeling to it uh, that really distracts you, uh, takes you away from reality and lets you think and see the images in a, in, like they are coming from a different world, from a different reality. Were you hoping that uh, the audience, me as a viewer, would sort of situate themselves in the film? Because I felt that way a little bit. It, 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 it almost uh, said period piece in a way. Mm -hmm. Right, and I know you do jump back and forth. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you said in another interview, I think you, you, you're trying to shy away from American storytelling. Mm -hmm. You're trying some different things there, and I just wondered if that was partially, you know, by yeah. design too. I wanted the film to to feel like an like a Native American tale in a way. It's a, and they have a very different conception of time and a very mm. concept, different conception of storytelling. So I wanted to try to. Uh, approach the viewer to this way of seeing the world. So it's, uh, you, so it's a film in which it's natural to feel a, a little bit lost, because say, in the Amazon you feel a, a little bit lost all the time. And uh, it has to do with, uh, they, they don't see time as a linear, as a, in a linear way that we see it in the West. To them, time is a multiplicity of, uh, of simultaneous events which, in, which is, funnily enough, very close to what uh, you know, quantum scientists say uh, of the, their description of time. So this idea of time being, a, be, being simul simultaneous past, present, and future, and the idea of uh, a single story being, be, being a single life being 
be, being possible to be lived by many men. That was the starting point, point for me when, when approaching the story. You know, you just brought up quantum physics and so on in science, and science plays a big role in this film. You know, there's a great line uh, from one of, one of the, uh, uh, the indigenous folk uh, when, a, when a white scientist says, I devote my life to plants, and he responds with, that's the most reasonable thing I've heard a white man say, which I laughed out loud in the theater. But um, so here's a scientist meeting the Amazon for maybe the first time. Are you suspicious, uh, would you say, of science uh, and and the things that it's going to bring to us? You know, mm -hmm. the, uh, where are you? Are you afraid of where we're heading? You know, what what was interesting to me about the story was that it was actually the the meeting of two scientists, uh, two scientists from different uh, knowledges. So the shaman and the and and the protagonist who is the shaman and the the explorers, who one come from, coming from Germany and the other one coming from the States, uh, they are they are scientists of, of their world, but the shaman is a, is a scientist of his own world. So, and it's a very different way of approaching the, of approaching knowledge, but they are both valid. So I'm I, I'm not at all afraid of science. You know, it's not a, it's not some. I think knowledge is important and essential. It's just that. A, the way we approach it is not the only way that it can be approached, and we should not. And science, Western science, can be sometimes very arrogant in that fact that uh, only what's mm -hmm. what facts, what what is factual right. counts. Right. Two, two plus two equals five. <coughs> give, give me the facts. Give me the data. Uh -huh. Show me the spreadsheet. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Lay it out for me. And uh, it's uh, it's sort of overseas. I mean, ignores a, a, a major part of. Of knowledge, which is that what we cannot grasp, that what, what, what is not physical, and that is essentially what makes us human, you know. And that and that is the paradox because because science all the time is asking these major questions, and these major questions cannot be asked. I, I think they cannot be answered by science. Well, I mean, aren't you aren't you kind of ta you're talking about tacit knowledge, really? You're mm -hmm. talking about what you know, kind of the um, the knowledge that a a cabinet maker mm -hmm. or a craft, some kind of craftsperson passes on to their apprentice, mm -hmm. right? The knowledge that you can't make explicit. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me, uh, you know, I do a lot of work in Southeast Asia. We've got uh, cultures um, that, ha if, if they're not passing on those traditions, they're being lost forever. And I mean, that's definitely a subtext of this film, is it not? Yeah. Uh, the uh, the native, native peoples of the Amazon, they have a, their tradition is oral. And it has a very important reason to be oral. You know, you, you, when you arrive, sometimes you, you ask, why is not this tradition not written, not put down, not, not kept? But uh, it happens that when you, for, to, to them, they have a, a their, their belief is that if you put something, if you write something down, if you put it down, uh, it dies. Hmm. Knowledge should always be changing and transforming. Otherwise, you're grabbed, you're, you have a, you are trapped by the past, and knowledge should not be in the past. You know, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be something that someone wrote many years ago. It should be something that is always changing and always making itself richer with every person that learns. So there's a there's and an transmits it. There's an openness. Mm -hmm. There's an openness to it. There's. Uh I am suspicious of science to some degree. I mean, we we benefit from. The fruits of applied science all the time, right? Mm -hmm. The pod, the podcast we're doing right now, fruits of applied science, mm -hmm. the uh, the building that we're in, and so on. But but I'm I'm concerned about uh, uh, some of those um, hmm, almost morally ambiguous things that are are, are are being generated as a result of some some of the types of questions that are being asked and discoveries that are being made. There's a great scene in the film where uh, uh, one of the main characters has a compass. And one of the local um, natives has taken his compass, and supposedly he, he he takes that back because he's concerned that they're going to start relying on technology. It was a really interesting scene to me. Can you tell me about that? Because you've got then the other uh, voice, native voice, saying, "Well, you can't stop them from learning." But the scientist was upset about the fact that they might, you know, mm -hmm. benefit from technology in a way. And it was really kind of a east meets west kind of north south thing going mm -hmm. on. Yeah, it's, it's it's just the different ways in which we approach knowledge, and for and there's a, a whole trend of in thinking that should about indigenous peoples that we should try to 
keep them the way they are, you know, or keep them the way they used to be 100 or 200 years ago, or the, the original way. And it's a very Christian thing mm. about like a, 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 forgot, a, a lost uh, paradise, you know, a lost Eden, a Garden of Eden thing that they need to be kept in. But their approach to knowledge is not, not, not this at all. They just take what they need and they, they make the best of it and they, and they keep learning and, and, and they have no problem in, in disposing of whatever's in their reach and turning it in. For example, if you uh, to go some, uh, something a bit more polemic is when you talk to them about Jesus, for example. But the, the, the way some people would look at it is that, you know, you shouldn't try to convert them to religion or anything. But the fact to them is that uh, if they can learn from Jesus, it's great. Because he, he already taught a lot, of, a lot of things to these white people, you know, and he changed their lives. So why not, why, why not, why would not uh, take what we need from him, from his lessons, from his... And, they, and that's what, and it's like, it's the same if it's a plant, it's the same if, if it's a car, it's the same if, if it's a tool, it's the same if, if it's a belief, you know. It's like uh, they don't uh, put any knowledge as better one over the other, you know? They, 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 they can learn from anything and they know that and they believe that everything is full of knowledge, you know? And they, and they have to learn from the bee, from the flower, as well as from the white man in, 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 in any case. And yet they're very suspicious of the white man and rightfully so in this, in this context. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of what seems to be anger, mm -hmm. a lot of fear, a lot of mistrust in, in this film. The church. Uh, doesn't fare too well uh, mm -hmm. in in the film, and d is that your own sort of personal uh, critique of that? Would you say coming out in the film as a writer director, or is that uh, a kind of a general consensus? Would you say mm -hmm. it's not a personal critique? It's just that when it's just uh, what I learned from about uh, researching the history of the of the Colombian Amazon. You know, it's a place that has been ravaged one, one, mm. e every now and then. It was first, it was, uh, we call it Kina, I'm not sure how to say it in English. Then it was the rubber, then mm. it was the coca for the drugs, and now it's the mining companies that want to come into the Amazon. But there's always something that comes in and that, that people uh, from the outside world want and that it brings destruction. And there are different tools to, to bring on that destruction, and sadly, religion has been one of them in the mm -hmm. past. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this is just something that uh, is part of people's lives, and they they recognize it. And I think it's important to. It's a part of history that has been pretty much forgotten, or and definitely in Colombia is is not talked about. And I wanted to, to bring it to 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 the table in the in the debate is, of Colombians. Is, uh, Ciro, is it not talked about because they're afraid to talk about it, or because it's just kind of an unknown? History. I've, I've watched a film this festival called The Ninth Floor uh, about a riot, a racial riot in 1969 in Montreal. I knew nothing about it. I was four mm -hmm. years old at the time. Hidden, yeah. hidden past of Canada, right? Yeah, it's just hidden past. It's just hidden. You know, it's just things that at some point be, are not comfortable to, to discuss. And, they, and, if we, and if we don't use tools like cinema yes. to, to discuss them, to bring them back, then they get lost, you know, and they get forgotten. You talk about, uh, in an interview uh, that I found, uh, about a point in the film where you thought you were, you were done for, that uh, production was going to halt, uh, you were running out of money, and, uh, too time. Your, your, your dreams were too lofty. And you, you, you talk about a mystery and a miracle that I found really interesting uh, about the jungle. And it almost sounds kind of romantic in a way, right? Mm -hmm, yeah. can, you, can you tell me what, what actually happened? Or, and, or, I mean, it sounds kind of spiritual. Sort of. Yeah. Well, this th there hadn't been a, a fiction film done in the Ama in the Colombian Amazon for the last thirty years, and there's a good reason for that. You know, it's very difficult. Yes. In terms what of was that film, by the way? The last film that was shot was maybe uh, it's called Amazonas para dos aventureros, Amazon for two adventures, which is kind of like Tarzan doing uh, a sort of Tarzan thing going right, on. Right. Right. Thirty years. Wow. Yeah. So. You, and well, yeah, and you you can see why. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a, it was a very risky production. Sure. And uh, we, at, during the first week of shooting, I realized that everything had to be perfect in order to, for the film to be able to be completed. And it never is. It never happens. You know, there's always problems and there's always setbacks. And a minor setback on this film will, will have ended production. Hmm. Uh, for example, during pre-production, we saw rain falling for about, uh, I don't know, 70 hours. 
straight. Seven zero. Yeah. <laughs> that's a lot of rain. Yeah, that's a lot of rain. And it's, it's normal in the Amazon, but if this had happened during production, it would have been a disaster. Sure. So we we asked for the help of the community and we, and we were very respectful of the place and we wanted to do a production that didn't make an impact uh, on, on the environment on that the we environment. were doing. Sure, sure, doing no harm. Exactly. And so the, 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 the local communities were very appreciative of that and, they, and one of their shamans uh, gave us a special protection. And he, he, and he held a small ceremony in which he... Hmm. He asked the jungle to protect us, to, hmm. to collaborate with us. And for then, after the, when we started shooting, I, re I realized this is going to be too difficult. Every, every shot is difficult to make. Every, every camera angle, every, everything was like 10 times more difficult than in a normal production. So I said, this is probably not going to work. <laughs> this is probably not going to be possible. But then we felt like the jungle started to collaborate with us. Things happened like uh, we, st we would stop at noon for lunch and it would start to rain and it would rain for one hour and stop. And we, could, we were able to continue shooting. At 6 p.m. we would stop shooting and the rain would come immediately. And there were no accidents, there were no diseases. No, we saw all kinds of snakes and bugs and whatever. I, I bet. But we, no, there was no, no one attacked by anything. And we also started feeling very comfortable. You know, we, we didn't, it was a, it's a rough environment, definitely, but uh, we didn't, but we started to feel at home. You know, in in, in this environment. So it, but it was so it was a stranger part coming back to the city afterwards. I bet yeah. because you well, you already you start to see the world from a different perspective. So it became for for all the crew a very spiritual adventure for us. And we, that's what we hope to be able to offer to the audience. It's a great, there's a great shot in the, I mean, there's so many great, wonderful shots, by the way. And your wife was the producer on this film? Yeah, she's Christina. She's the main reason why the film was made. She's the one who believed So how most. come she's not here today, Cyril? <laughs> no, she's coming, she's coming later. <laughs> oh, very good. So there's a great scene where uh, one of the characters, uh, is, is it, I'm going to pronounce it wrong, Karen Makati? No, it's good. That's yeah. a good pronunciation. So he sees that they brought a rifle with them, a gun, and he grabs it from them and throws it into the river. And we see the splash and ripple effect of that. And it was a, uh, 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 in some way, I almost wish you had held on that a little longer, that ripple, right? Mm -hmm. what, what are the implications here? The exploitation, the mining, the coca, the rubber, etc. cetera, mm -hmm. right? But also... You know the good stuff, like you say, you're coming out of the the, the crew. I mean, their their lives will never be the same. Mm -hmm. Forget about the film, just about the production. I love that. I'm getting goosebumps. You mm -hmm. know, I love that those lives will never be the same. Um, so the river plays. Uh, to, and I was going to say to say that the jungle is a character in the film almost seems like a cliche in a way, but after hearing you tell the story about the collaboration, it's marvelous. Uh, the river is clearly a, a, a main theme and, and a, a, a character as well, I suppose, in the film. You know, Heraclitus, the Greek philosopher, said you can't step in the river, the same river, twice. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, and what you said earlier, to circle back about knowledge and about it's always in a state of flux and change. I mean, I just, there's so many layers. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really quite remarkable. Yeah, we wanted this river to, we, we shot this, this specific part of the Amazon because the rivers are black. Mm. And they are very dark rivers, and they look impenetrable, and they are and they are really nice. mysterious rivers. You know, it's uh, and in the Amazon, it's not just uh, the Amazon is about the size of the United States. You know, the Amazon basin, it's a huge place, and there are so many rivers. You know, they, they, they're all connected to the main river, but uh, there are just like a thousand rivers, different rivers, and you have mm. rivers that are red, rivers that are brown, rivers that are white. And you have these black rivers, you know, and, and they are very unique and special. They are full of minerals. I was going to say, are they mineral rich? Yeah, they are rich in minerals. So that's why mining companies are discovering them. And, and they are sacred rivers, you know. They, they, these are places that we, we, we got the, uh, a very specific and important authorization to shoot in this, uh, what we call them cachiveras, these rapids, which are the places that for the indigenous peoples are the places where humanity was born. Mm. So they start, and if they don't give you permission, you cannot shoot there, you know. And if they say, you know, this is not going to work, then it doesn't work. They built a hydroelectric plant nearby, and the indigenous community said, you know, this is not going to work. And it's been 10 years, and the, the hydroelectric hasn't worked. They, they have brought in all kinds of engineers, and they've got all kinds of uh, 
from all over the world and the, the thing doesn't work. So if it's a, it's, what's cool about the Amazon is that it's a, it's a place that really escapes our rational knowledge. It's, 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 I, I it's, so love that theme in the film and what you're talking about here because, I mean, from a philosophical perspective, I think philosophy has cheated itself to some degree because they've, they've, they've focused so much, been hypnotized by the proposition, by the sentence, like the scientist with the data, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. How does this relate to this when, in fact, there's a whole other world of knowledge out there mm -hmm. and a way of understanding and comprehending and apprehending that, that we are kind of losing or maybe not just as aware of as we should. There's a beautiful scene in the film where... Uh, I, and I can't remember this character's name, but again, uh, indigenous, and he says, you need to listen closer, basically, but not with just your ears. Mm -hmm. Just say, uh, they, 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 it's funny when you start relating what uh, the ancient knowledge yeah. to what science is say, you know. They used to say that, uh, the shamans for, for centuries say, say that, you shouldn't trust your senses. You know, there's a lot more out right, there. Right. And now, Greek and now, notion as well, right? Yeah, and science now proves, has proven it. You know, you, you you would need like many more senses to cut to in order to perceive everything that is in the world. You know, you only perceive like seven percent of what the world is uh, with your senses. Uh, they 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 talk about the atom uh, many years ago. You know, before the science started talking about the atom. You know, about the uh, uh, atomic structure of things. You know, and how this atomic and 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 they believe that the uh, human mind is so powerful that it can change reality, that it can rewrite reality, and that rea reality is rewritten as it, it's, uh, as, as it is said. And that is something that uh, I think in the West we have always seen it as uh, sorcery or superstition or folklore. You know, we all, there's always these categories for understating other knowledge, the, for depreciating other knowledge. And I think it's, but I think we're realizing now, that in this century, I think. Mankind has, is realizing that uh, maybe it's not, maybe we, we, we weren't so right after all, you know, and this planet is starting to to, to make, make its uh, payback, you know. There's a, there's a sense of, um, of arrogance, right? The, mm -hmm. We lack a certain humility when it comes to each other, mm -hmm. uh, to the environment. And, and just to the cosmos, really, and to the way it, it can treat us. And, it, uh, and if we do listen with more than our ears, mm -hmm. what might we hear? And I think that's what's so wonderful about this focus of yours in the film on uh, non-traditional ways of knowing. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, a, this is an epistemological statement you're mm -hmm. making with such a beautiful film about the environment, really, on some level. So mm -hmm. to say it's layered is an understatement, Zero. You say that, uh, you know, you quote, whenever I looked at a map of my country, I was overwhelmed by great uncertainty, close quote. Um, so obviously that's a genesis for you for this film, I suppose, the mm -hmm. photos, kind of a th certain events coming together. But tell me, tell me more about that uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, Colombia, it's a very big country, but half of the country is the Amazon. Mm. And we really, Colombian society has turned its, its back completely on this on the Amazon, it may, it may be seen as a source of uh, resources, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, really, there's, there's not much interest or care about what's about what's there. You know, about its culture, about its history, about the peoples who inhabit it. And to me, that was the the great unknown. And I said, you know, there's got to be something more about it. You know, so I said. I, I had come from two previous films that uh, were, drew heavily on personal experience. Oh, okay. So I wanted to take to go in the other direction, to take a journey into the unknown, and invite the viewer into into this un, into this great unknown. Uh, so it so it's, I, uh, it was a great adventure, you know. I, I, and but I thought it was going to be definitely a lot easier when I started it, you know, because. Right. Because the script, uh, just the writing the film, demanded that I started changing my point of view. And changing hmm. my point of view well, proved to be extremely difficult. So tell me more about what do you mean you had to change your point of view? Like your, uh, your actual sort of understanding of the world? Yeah. Or your point of view from a director's perspective because it rained today, therefore we have to... Like, do you mean technically or do you mean kind of... You know, as a human being. No, as a human being, wow, and, that, okay. and that led to to the other to to the way you see the world. That's why the that's why, for example, I I, I felt an I felt an urgent need at the beginning 
to make the story clear to the audience immediately. Mm. You know, clear what 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 is the timing of the story? What is like the, more classic storytelling? Yeah, yeah, sense. because that's what because I thought you know the, the audience needs this in mm -hmm, order to mm -hmm. understand this place. But then I realized it wasn't so it wasn't the, it wasn't so important, and we I needed I needed to embrace the 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 uncertainty. And bring the the viewer into this uncertainty, the the non traditional way of, uh -huh. of knowing and understanding, right? and storytelling. Then, yeah, and definitely storytelling. Awesome. So it's uh, I didn't know the story could be told in this manner than in which the film is finally told. I didn't know if it was going to work, but at some point I just had to let go and you know and and, and see what and see if it worked or not. But but it was a, a huge leap of faith. And there are many scenes in the film that I wasn't really in control of, you know, I, mm. and I and I don't really understand how they worked, so why they worked so much because you know we, we shot the film on 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 film on 35 millimeter film, so we only had like two takes. Wow! For for, for every shot, wow. we wasn't, we was was take one, take two, and that, and that, and that's it. You don't have a, you don't have this liberty to do as many as many takes of every shot. And there were times when you know we you just have this one shot, light is going, uh, and we're done. You know we, we just have one shot, and we would do the shot, and the shot would be perfect, and better than if we had rehearsed it and done several takes and everything. So, and I and, and I understand. You know I, I understood also. I, I there was a lot of letting go for me in the film. Right. Hmm. In, in in making the film, letting go of what I thought I knew, which is what you wouldn't normally think a director would do. Mm -hmm. Right, you got to be a control freak to be a director to some degree, don't you? To some degree, but I understand <laughs> that. Uh, but this movie taught me otherwise, you know. Uh, and there, there are so many elements in, involved in a, in a film that you cannot possibly think of controlling them all. Sure. You have to trust. Sure. You have to let go, and you have to. What you have to do is bring yourself and the crew and the cast to a state, to a spiritual state in yeah. which magical magic things can happen. Well, yeah, and you know. Sorry for the going down the road of philosophy. Michael Polanyi would say that what you were doing was indwelling all the particulars, all the little bits and pieces, the, mm -hmm. the story that you, the photos you first saw, the map of your country, your relationships. You were bringing it all to bear on the film, and it was coming out in ways that you can't even, you know, in a traditional, explicit way, put your finger on. Which I think is just it's proof of what you've wanted to try to do with the film to yeah. me, which is remarkable. Um, Shiro, do you think? Uh, at the risk of sounding a little corny, what do you think this film has to say, you know, to my son and my daughter, seven, ten years old? What does it have to tell us about the future? You know, the mining companies that are coming in. Of course, there's the, you know, be careful, do no yeah. harm, which we know they're not doing. But what what other sort of messages you're hoping people might take away? Yeah, well, if I could put it into words, I would not make a film. <laughs> uh, nice. I, would, I would write a book or something. That's right. Yeah. The, the the nice thing about cinema is that it has such a it's so unpredictable, and it's so ri it's, it's so rich in in meaning and layers that not only the filmmakers put in, I think the audience puts them in as well. So people have nice. found meanings in this film that I really would uh, I find really surprising, but I but I think that they are just as valid as what we, as anything I might have wished to say, you know. So the film is, and all the films are made. Are, are, that's what something I like about storytelling is that uh, our films are are very open, and they are open to what you can bring to them as a viewer. And I like that. I like active viewers. I don't say. I don't like a, a movie that is like that. Say, spoon fits the audience. You know, I think uh, audiences can be active and and they can use their imagination. And they can complete and enrich in the films. So I'm sure your son and daughter will uh, bring something to the film with their eyes, with their thoughts that will make the film infinitely richer than anything that I might say, try to say to them. It's good. I think you know. I think just on a certain level, you know, my son's uh, ten, daughter seven. They're they're far more environmentally conscious than I am. I'm going to be 50 next week. I, I wasn't raised that way, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not a part of, it's not in my bloodstream quite the way that it will be in theirs. And so, you know, to your point, what will that, how will that impact their understanding or their viewing of this film? And I think you're right. I think it's, I think it's marvelous. Um, is it, is it a, is it a warning to some degree, you know, colonization still going on in the world? You talk about the brutality mm -hmm. and I, I was struck by, I'm just amazed some of the scenes of what men and women uh, men, plural, 
will do to others mm -hmm. in the pursuit of wealth or power or whatever. Yeah, well, you know, we, we had the robber exploitation is possibly the worst holocaust that we lived in Colombia. And it's a story that is, you ask any Colombians and most people don't know about it. Mm. And this robber exploitation was brutal uh, in Colombia and Africa. And uh, it, it, it went on for, I don't know, 50 years before it was, it was stopped, you know. Because this, in, in, in the world that we used to live in, these indigenous peoples were worthless, you know, they were primitive, mm. Mm. they were... Pe well, pagan is the word. Yeah, they were pagan, they, uh, they, were, and they were cannibals, you know, yes, they, right. they, that's what they call them. And so it was, yeah, it was easy to dispose of them. And I think that we, we have made some, quite some progress in this century, you know, because uh, the world is very different from what it was a hundred years ago. There's a, there's a whole new conscious that has been awakened. A hundred years ago, no one cared about learning about other languages, about preserving any cultures, about preserving the environment. That was a joke a hundred years ago. And I think uh, these explorers and, their, what, and their, their, what they told us about other knowledges really helped us this, open our eyes to, another way, to, to this other way of exploring. And now we, we, we see the world differently and the following generations will see the world differently. And they, when, when it's, it's just when you see a forest, what do you see, you know? Do you see a, 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 a process of evolution of a, a million years together? Or do you see the spirits of ancestors? Or do you see a, a lot of log, a lot of wood to, to, to make burn. It, to burn? What do you see when you look at it? So I, I think that's changed and, that's it's, great and, it's, and it keeps changing, you know. You know, for a guy who, uh, we've got to wrap it up here, I want to honor and respect your time here, but what to, for a guy who's made a film that is such a critique of colonialization, of, of a disrespect for the other or of exploitation, I guess is maybe, maybe capital E, you seem awfully hopeful, Cyril. You believe in change. The world is becoming a better place. And I think that's, I mean, that's an encouragement to me. It's an encouragement to our listeners. And I think, I think that does really come through in the film as well. Mm -hmm. um, um, and again, maybe that's uh, the, the, that, that black and white contrast, right? And everything in between. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, I am an optimist. Uh, because otherwise, you, it's, um, I don't think it's possible to live in the world otherwise. <laughs> What's know? the alternative? What's the alternative, yeah, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I, people say, you know, when they ask, hey, I, do you believe in God? I say, I'm, I'm, I'm a lot crazier than that. I believe in men. Ah, very nice. Listen, Ciro, thank you so much for joining us today. Your film, Embrace of the Serpent, I understand, just was told by the publicist this morning. It's, it's going to be a wide release. It's been picked up by many uh, distributors. Yeah, it's getting, tell, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it was, it's going to get a release here in Canada and Excellent. also Good. in the United States. And it's, a, it's getting a release in about 25 countries. Next week it's going to be released in Hungary, soon in France and most of Europe. And yeah, it's, it's a film that is going to just, uh, thankfully find an audience, which is difficult. It was released in May for the Colombian, in the Colombian theaters and it was a big hit. A big nice. success, a very, a very surprising success because Excellent. people didn't think that it was going to be. So, are you buying lunch today for us? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I get, I get an, another shot on making a film. Nice. So that's uh, this well. Is con congratulations on a, a remarkable achievement and a, and a stunning film, and and thank you for joining us today. No, thank you very much, and you're all invited to hopefully see the film whenever it comes Absolutely. your way. Absolutely, keep your eyes on Tiff.